Roscosmos cosmonaut Alexei Ovchinin. To his right are NASA astronauts Nick Haig and Christina Cook. And McLean will be the one capturing the Cygnus vehicle. And operator, she'll be back. David St. Jacques of the Canadian Space Agency, Nick Haig stands to monitor telemetry during the approach of the Cygnus vehicle to the International Space Station. On top of the Antares rocket, you can see the fairing. Underneath the fairing uh, is the Cygnus cargo vehicle loaded with about 7,600 pounds of cargo. To date, that is the largest load that was flown, uh, a Cygnus vehicle to be flown on an Antares rocket. You can see the breakdown here. Just about half of that are scientific investigations, many of which will be loaded uh, onto the International Space Station, some of which were part of a late load procedure, which we'll go over during today's broadcast. International Space. Back at the pad, you can see a bit of ducting. This is conditioned air that's being fed to the payload bay and to the first stage at the bottom of the vehicle. And air that's being fed to the plenty of food and supplies and scientific experiments aboard the Cygnus vehicle. Some of the food included include uh, many items like smoked turkey, pork chops, shrimp cocktail, mashed potatoes, candied yams. The list goes on. Again, some of the conditioned air billowing from the Antares vehicle. This air is being fed to the payload bay at the top where the Cygnus vehicle is housed and of course the first stage at the bottom. It's gonna be a series of milestones. First the go, no, go conducted here in Mission Control Houston. At this time, the uh, Antares has already been loaded, the two liquid fuel engines with liquid uh, oxygen and R21 kerosene. At the T-30 mark, we'll, uh, began the final checks of the flight termination systems already underway. At 22 seconds before launch, uh, you will see the transporter erector launcher um, will retract from the vehicle. That's that sort of scaffolding you're seeing in this view of the launch vehicle out at Pad 0A at the Mid-Atlantic Regional Spaceport. After this tower pulls back, it'll be another 10 minutes until a go-no-go no go poll is conducted from Mission Control Center at Dulles. The Northrop Grumman flight controllers will conduct a go-no-go no go for the final steps to commence launch. Again, that launch 3.46 p.m. Central Time today. At T-minus 5, the vehicle will switch to internal power before 3 minutes and 30 seconds before launch, which will initiate auto-sequence handoff for terminal countdown. Essentially, this will mark the time where the computers take over for the final steps up through the launch at T-minus 0. At about T minus 40, as part of this automatic sequence, the takes will be pressurized until, and this is the uh, one of the major final steps until T minus zero liftoff. Again, 3:46 p.m. and seven seconds p.m. Central Time today. After liftoff, that first stage will burn for 3 minutes 35 seconds until main engine cutoff. You'll hear performance calls from Northrop Grumman flight controllers marking the status of the vehicle and the rocket throughout its journey. After main engine cutoff, we'll await stage one separation. Uh, the second stage and the rest of the vehicle will coast for a bit before the fairing separation occurs to reveal the Cygnus underneath, and the inner stage at the back of, the, of this configuration of the vehicle will separate, the inner stage being an adapter that connects the first and second stages. After this short coasting period will be stage two ignition. This uh, second stage burns for two minutes and 30 seconds and is a solid rocket motor, meaning the whole thing will burn. During the two minutes and 30 seconds, the vehicle will climb about 40 miles before the engine uh, is exhausted over that two minutes and 30 second burn. 
After the uh, second, second stage burnout, uh, the vehicle will coast for two minutes before the Cygnus separation occurs just after the nine minute mark into flight and the vehicle is inserted into orbit. We'll stand by for just over two hours where there'll be a series of burns before the solar arrays are deployed. We'll be back on for that coverage at 6 p.m. Central Time. The solar array deploy occurs over just about half an hour. After that, there's a series of milestones, including some burrs over the next day and a half until the ultimate rendezvous of the Cygnus cargo vehicle on its CRS-11 mission to the International Space Station on Friday, April 19th, for a capture schedule at 4.30 Central Time. It's a busy time in space flight. This mission will be followed shortly, uh, just over a week from Friday, or just about a week from Friday, of the SpaceX Dragon on a CRS-17 mission. That's April 26th, and it'll stay in orbit for one month. The Cygnus will conclude its mission to the International Space Station in July, in July, separating with thousands of pounds of trash from the station, and then begin a solo long-duration mission in space. At this time, the transporter erector, this is that scaffolding you see to the left, the vehicle has been armed. We should sort shortly see the uh, that transporter erector uh, start to back away just here in a few minutes. At T-22, the, the, the arming transporter erector has been armed. It'll take some time before it retracts, actually shortly before the time of launch. Every Cygnus vehicle is named after a major contributor in the world of spaceflight. All of the all of the folks that it's named after have passed. This vehicle, the Northrop Grumman, uh, on its commercial resupply, uh, mission 11, is named the SS Roger Chaffee. Roger Chaffee was born February 15, 1935, in Grand Rapids, Michigan. He got his private pilot's license through the Naval Reserve Officers Training Corps before graduating from Purdue in 1957 with a bachelor's in aeronautical engineering. After graduation, he flew for the Navy and accumulated over 1,800 flight hours before his selection as an astronaut for the Apollo program in 1963. He began his training as an astronaut in 1964, and during his time of training served as a CABCOM in mission control during the Gemini program. He received an assignment to fly on the first flight of Apollo in January 1966. On January 27, 1967, Chaffee, along with Virgil, Gus Grissom, and Ed White perished in a fire that ignited during a plugs-out test of the Apollo command module out of the Kennedy Space Center. Chaffee's sacrifice began redesigns of the Apollo vehicles that ultimately landed Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin on the moon nearly 50 years ago on July 20, 1969.
the Apollo program being 50 years ago. Just about a month from now, in the middle of May, will be the 50th anniversary of the launch of the Apollo 10 mission. And of course, the landing of Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin on the moon will, this year, uh, in uh, 2019, will be the 50th anniversary of the landing on the moon. Everything's still on track for an on-time launch at 3.46 p.m. Central minutes away from that time. Everything checking the vehicle milestones as we count down to liftoff. Joining me in Mission Control today is Robin Hurd, the Deputy Program Manager for Launch Vehicles out at uh, North of Grumman. Robin, thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me today. I'm really excited to be here. I'm curious to hear more about the Antares vehicle. Now, Now this is the Antares 230 vehicle. There's a little bit of modifications that happen for this late load capability. Tell us about the vehicle. What is the vehicle that's actually launching Cygnus today? Absolutely. So uh, NG-11 is the mission that will uh, fulfill our contract to NASA under the uh, CRS-1, or the first phase of our commercial um, resupply services contract with NASA. Uh, so our next mission will be CRS-2, and for that we'll be flying a vehicle configuration that we call 230 plus, uh, but we, what we have here today is a little bit of a hybrid. It, it's a bit of an upgrade um, from the 230, just so that we can provide a little more performance. Um, and one of the things that it has available to it is uh, what we call a, a pop-top fairing. Uh, so it allows us to perform uh, a load of cargo uh, later in the flow than we normally would, and actually is, is able to be performed at the launch pad now. So tell me about the uh, construction of Antares. When, about the time do you actually get the call to design an Antares, know when the launch is, and begin the process to start uh, getting ready for an on-time launch? Sure. So, you know, if you want to go all the way back to the component level, um, the process of building an Antares actually starts years before um, we launch. But in terms of integration, uh, a flow would take typically six to nine months uh, from the time that we uh, gather up all of the different assemblies and bring them into our uh, our horizontal integration facility uh, at Wallops Island uh, and start pulling them together into something that you could actually identify as a rocket. <laughs> Now, uh, you said this was a little bit of a different configuration. Tell me about the late load process. What was different about this particular launch? Sure. So uh, one of the, the unique features of this launch is the, the cargo late load. So we have built some uh, new electrical and mechanical ground support equipment uh, that allows us to actually take the vehicle from the, the configuration you see here, uh, where it's, it's vertical at the pad. It can actually uh, convert down back into the horizontal position. We're able to uh, drive what we call a, a mobile clean room right up to the tip of the fairing so that we can load uh, time-sensitive research uh, and, and other parameters perishable uh, items that NASA needs to provide uh, within 24 hours of launch. And that's a pretty tight turnaround, but there's a critical science that's actually being loaded into Cygnus to accommodate this. One of them is the Rotom Research 12 mission. Uh, that'll be arriving at the station and then, of course, uh, be one of the first, actually, experiments to come out of Cygnus once it arrives. Now, uh, we have some photos of rollout here. Tell me about the rollout process. Once it's ready to go, what does that look like? Yeah, so that looks like a, just a beautiful evening at the eastern shore there for rollout. Um, so you can see that we have some, some tarps over the top of the fairing there. That just helps uh, keep everything environmentally protected. Uh, we've got the transporter erector launcher there that's being used to roll the vehicle uh, from about a mile from our horizontal integration facility out to the pad. Uh, that's a slow process. It goes probably about a mile per hour. It's a pretty slow walk for the folks that accompany it out to the pad. And there's another beautiful shot with the, the big uh, NASA meatball on the water tower there. Now, of course, here it is, a live view, again, billing some of that conditioned air. We're now tracking just about 13 minutes from launch. Everything looking good. As you can tell, this is an afternoon launch, a beautiful day, clear skies, just about 54 degrees Fahrenheit, and everything's on track. And we've been counting down these milestones to an on-time launch so far. 
Now, one of the next uh, milestones that we're looking forward to is a go, no go poll from uh, Northrop Grumman flight controllers over at Dulles. What are they looking for? What are the things that they're checking from the operations side? So, so they're going to be polling uh, folks like our Antares chief engineer, all of the safety officers, and some of the key engineering leads. Uh, and those folks are going to be looking at their telemetry data, making sure that the health and the status of the vehicle uh, is all within constraints and that we are ready to go into the final stages of launch today. Now, of course, after launch, it'll lift off and rendezvous with the station in just over uh, a day and a half. It'll remain there for three months until it separates and begins an extended stay. Part of that is some secondary missions, including the deployment of some thin sats. What are these thin sats that the Cygnus is going to be deploying? So I'm glad you asked. Uh, the ThinSats are a really cool project. They're a secondary payload on Antares. Uh, they'll deploy after Cygnus has been uh, deployed into the into the uh, orbit. Um, the ThinSats are uh, they're student-led um, satellites. So they were created by uh, students in uh, nine different states, actually, and they're going to allow um, kids to see things like a GPS position, uh, temperature, and and just get real telemetry data from space, which is really neat. And that's an exciting time. Of course, it has the mission to the International Space Station to conduct first, and we'll expect that here uh, on time in just under 12 minutes. At this time, Northrop Grumman has already conducted their go, no-go poll, and from the Northrop Grumman side, we are go. Now, again, part of these milestones is uh, from the go-no-go no, poll. And uh, just about five minutes before launch, uh, the vehicle will switch to internal power. And then we'll begin the initiate auto sequence handout for terminal countdown. And Ops 2, this is LC on countdown 1, step 394. Your go to start engine evacuation. LC Ops 2, evac started. Now what you're hearing is some of the calls from Northrop Grumman flight controllers tracking some of the milestones before we get to that final launch at 3.46 uh, p.m. Central Time today. Some exciting scientific investigations going to the International Space Station here in just about 10 minutes away from launch. Everything tracking from the Northrop Grumman side to be an on-time launch today. One of the investigations going up is a robot uh, called Astro B. This is NASA's next generation of free-flying robots aboard the station. They're self-contained, cube-shaped robots and are designed yeah, to help well, scientists and engineers develop and test account. technologies for use in microgravity to assist astronauts with routine chores and give ground controllers additional eyes and ears on the space station. Now, these robots, powered by fans and vision-based navigation, perform crew monitoring, sampling, logistics management, and accommodate up to three investigations. They can oper be operated automatically or from the ground. Another investigation are manufacturing fiber optic cables in microgravity. This is called space fibers. Uh, this, this investigation will evaluate a method for producing fiber optic cable from a blend of zirconium, barium, lithanium, sodium, and aluminum. This is called Z-Blan in space. Z-Blan produces glass 100 times more transparent than silica-based glass, exceptional for fiber optics. Microgravity suppresses two mechanisms that commonly degrade fiber, and previous studies showed improved properties in fiber drawn in microgravity compared to that fabricated on the ground. The Z-Blan fiber is a unique candidate for improved imaging, remote sensing, and next-generation optical communications on Earth due to its low loss and higher bandwidth. Enabled, voltage phenomenon, and commands are clear. Copy, like one, check 397 and 398. The bioanalyzer is another experiment from the Canadian Space Agency. Uh, this is an instrument that serves as a platform for scientific experiments where astronauts can easily test different body fluids such as blood, saliva, and urine and get returned 
key biomedical analyses within a few hours. Scientists will be able to use the bioanalyzer's data to accelerate science experiments. In the future, this type of device could help to keep a closer eye on astronauts' health. Another experiment uh, is this can, is this an image of David St. Jacques and the astronauts show accelerated uh, arterial stiffening during their time in space. These are thicker artery walls and signs associated with the development of insulin resistance after spending six months in space. And these dramatic changes in the carotid artery, uh, aging was unrecognized until recently. So the vascular aging investigation, this investigation you're seeing here, will include critical onboard investigations to test the relationship among a crew member's metabolism, aging arteries, and aging bones. The results of this study could have great importance for assessing a newly identified risk for astronaut cardiovascular health, potentially pointing to mechanisms to reduce risk. And these are, again, just a few and of the more than 3,400 pounds of science currently loaded on board Northrop Grumman's CRS-11 Cygnus vehicle, now under seven minutes from launch. VZX is closed, and OCCS is in automatic control mode. And I copy uh, Prop 1. LC, VTSO activation verified. Roger that. Check 402. Ops 2, 403, initialize ground ordinance power supplies. LC, Ops 2, ground ordinance power supplies initialized. LC, Elect 1, ground ordinance power supplies nominal. Copy, Elect 1. LC site control, FA ECS transfer to GN2 is confirmed. Copy that site control. We'll check 405 complete. So, Gary, you can see right now that the uh, the top half of the the uh, first stage is, is really very cold with that cryogenic liquid oxygen. Uh, the the Antares logo that you would normally see running down the side there is completely obscured by ice, and uh, and we've got uh, the uh, sort of evaporative process happening uh, on the liquid oxygen uh, boiling off of, of its relief valves and vent valves there. Coming up on T-minus five minutes. And Ops 2, your go for step 406, initiate engine priming. Priming started. Ops 1, you go to transfer avionics to internal power. LC Ops 1, avionics internal power on, standby five. You hear those calls, the vehicle okay, will switch to internal power. Before about three minutes, 30 seconds prior to launch, we'll initiate auto sequence handoff for terminal countdown. Open FTS zombie loop and verify green indication. LC Ops 1, FTS zombie loop open and green. Copy that, Ops 1. LC Elect 2, FTLU, and FTS receive indications are nominal. Copy Elect 2, we'll check 410. Ops 1, step 411, you go to send all arm command. LC Ops 1, all arm command sent. LC Elect 1, SNAs, ODMs, all armed. Copy Elect 1, NASA TD, report range status. Range is green. Copy, range is green. LC MES-1, priming verified, MES-1. Copy, priming verified, check 414. And launch team phase three dynamic limits will be active at T minus three minutes. FC 
Watch you command into flight mode. Three minutes before launch, we're now in the terminal Auto count until startup. launch on time, 3.46 p.m. Central Time. Odium bus voltages and currents are nominal. Roger, Alec 1. NAV, step 420, verify ready for NAV mode. LC NAV, or NAV ready for NAV mode. Ops 2, step 421, switch to NAV. Orb NAV to navigate. LC NAV, Orb NAV telemetry verified. Copy that NAV, we'll check 422 complete. Minus two minutes on my mark. Mark. Now under two minutes for launch, everything's still looking good during this automatic countdown. T minus 30, T minus 1 minute 30 seconds on my mark. Mark. And T minus one minute on my mark. Mark. Now under a minute to launch in just about 10 seconds, then takes will be pressurized. Everything's still on track for a liftoff on time. Minus 30 seconds. T minus 10. Five, four, three, two, one. And we have engine ignition. And we have liftoff of the Antares NG-11 mission to the ISS. Engines at full power. Attitude is nominal. Core pressurization looks good. Power systems look good. Stable operation, full power, both engines. Core pressures look solid. Attitude is nominal. TVC is nominal. Power systems look good. Engines remain at full thrust, operating nominally. Everything looking good during this first stage burn. Altitude it burns for 3 minutes 35 speed, seconds. Throttling back to 55% power. Attitude remains nominal. Nominal operation at 55% power. Throttling back up to full power. Engines are back to full power. TPC remains nominal. Attitude nominal, this plus uh, T plus 60 seconds. Altitude passes 25,000 feet. Pass through transonic. Attitude is nominal. Engines continue to operate at full power. Everything looking good, about 10 more seconds of this first stage burn. With nominal attitude, pass through 40,000 feet altitude. Engines remain nominal with full power. Fuel pressurization is nominal. VNG3 is on. Al altitude past 60,000 feet. Engines remain nominal. Attitude and power systems all look good. 
coming up on T plus uh, two minutes. Engines continue to operate nominally at 100% power. TVC steering, power systems. Attitude, two minutes into the flight, good. one minute, 30 seconds until this uh, main engine Altitude cutoff. Altitude passing through 100,000 feet. Power systems remain nominal. Attitude is good. Engines continue to operate at full power. Engines remain nominal. Power systems are good. Attitude is nominal. Core, core pressures look nominal. Approximately one minute till main engine cutoff. Engine power is nominal. Attitude is nominal. Avionics power is good. We're starting our slow throttle ramp for G limiting. 200,000 feet altitude as we approach T plus three minutes. Attitude remains nominal. 10,000 feet per second. Engines have throttled back to 55. About 30 more seconds of this burn. Pressure, Main engine will cut off. Stage one will separate, and, and the vehicle will coast for just a bit before fairing separation. Engine operation at 55% power is nominal. TVC slew for main engine cutoff has started. Attitude remains nominal. Engine operation continues to, remain, uh, to be nominal. Altitude 300,000 feet. And we have main engine cutoff. Attitude remains nominal post shutdown. Stage one separation. ACS performance is nominal. Stage two ignition will be in approximately 30 seconds. Again, this is a coast period. And Terry's is now coasting uh, in preparation for stage two ignition. Stage one delta V was 17,348 feet per second. Altitude is 130 kilometers. Interstage SEP. Attitude remains nominal. TVC batteries initiated. And we have stage two ignition. Attitude remains nominal. The Castro 30XL motor will burn for approximately two and a half minutes. Attitude is nominal. Motor pressure is nominal at, at approximately 100 PSI. Power systems look good. Stage two TVC is nominal. And attitude remains nominal. Everything looking good. The fairing has been awesome. separating. Cygnus is uh, now revealed in the inner stage at the back of the vehicle separated the before stage, stage two burn. ignition. Attitude remains nominal. Avionics power systems and temperatures all look good. Again, this is uh, solid rocket fuel. Attitude the entire thing will burn out over the course of two steering. minutes, 30 seconds. Stage Everything looking steering. good so far. Altitude is 170 kilometers. Power systems look good. Velocity is now five kilometers per second. Castro 30 burn continues. Motor pressure is 775 PSI. Attitude remains nominal. All systems look good at this point. Avionics power looks nominal. Attitude is nominal. Just uh, minor activity from the uh, stage two uh, attitude control system during the motor burn. TVC is nominal. Power is good. Motor pressure is now approximately 685 PSI. Velocity is six kilometers per second. Attitude is nominal. Altitude is 200 kilometers. Stage two TVC looks good. Power is nominal. Motor pressure just entering its slow tail off, now dropping below 500 PSI. TVC remains nominal. Power is good. Seven kilometers per second velocity. 
Attitude is nominal. Altitude is 205 kilometers. And we have stage two motor burnout. We'll now coast for approximately two minutes prior to Cygnus spacecraft separation. Second engine has burned out. The Cygnus vehicle traveling at uh, just under 17,000 miles per hour. Attitude is nominal. Hmm. All systems look good. Second stage attitude control system is starting to uh, reorient the vehicle for payload separation. Attitude remains nominal. Loss of signal on motor cone and stage one. All systems look good. We're just standing by for uh, Cygnus spacecraft separation. Attitude remains nominal. <clears throat> And all systems look green at this point. Avionics, power systems, attitude all look nominal as we come up on uh, mission time T plus 490 seconds. Vehicle is now uh, oriented for spacecraft separation. Attitude is nominal. Yeah, Gary, it looks like our uh, our telemetry uh, is a little unusual here. I think uh, I think we're we're showing a bit of a, a stale vehicle graphic here. At this point, uh, we've got uh, the stage two, the Castor 30XL, uh, with the uh, Cygnus payload still ha attached, uh, coasting and and ready for deployment. So imagine that instead of what we're showing here. <laughs> Attitude is good. Power systems look good. Sounds good and. Uh, just about uh, nine minutes after liftoff, we should be expecting Cygnus separation. All systems nominal at this point. Attitude and power continue to look good. And we have Cygnus spacecraft separation. And Terry's is reorienting for the collision and contamination avoidance maneuver. Insertion orbit looks nominal. And Terry's mission is complete. Initial results all look nominal, and we're signing yeah. off from the uh, LCC. Launch Control reporting a good ascent of the Cygnus vehicle on top of the Antares rocket, carrying it on its nine-minute journey into an orbital insertion. 7,600 pounds of cargo inside will make its way to the International Space Station over the next day and a half. Ready to rendezvous with the station Friday at 4.30 a.m. Central Time. Loss of signal on the avionics link. A series of a few milestones before we get to that point. There'll be a series of a few burns over the next about two hours uh, before we begin uh, solar array deploy. These are the two ultraflex solar arrays that are on the back of the Cygnus vehicle. Join us uh, for our live coverage of and that event at 6 p.m. Central Time tonight. Go ahead, LC. Yeah, let's uh, go ahead into our post-launch checklist here. Step 40. Northrop Grumman flight controllers you see here at the Mission Control Center in Dulles will be monitoring the vehicle over the next day and a half, overseeing all the milestones throughout its journey to the International Space Station. A good ascent of the Cygnus cargo vehicle and 7,600 pounds into orbit. Again, we'll be back on in just about two hours. 6 p.m. Central Time, 7 p.m. Eastern, uh, for our coverage of the solar array deploy. Ops one. Yeah, four. We'll conclude coverage and then come back for a capture on Friday, April 19th, scheduled for 4:30 a.m. Central Time. Again, Anne McLean uh, aboard the International Space Station will be the prime robotics operator to uh, grab that vehicle using the station's robotic arm to beat St. Jacques, backing her up, and Nick Haig monitoring telemetry.
verify indicator extinguished. A good ascent of uh, Cygnus into orbit over a nine minute journey. Again, we'll be back in the next two hours. This is Mission Control Houston.